Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about nutrition in pregnancy. I think it goes without saying that nutritional intake during pregnancy and that it's adequate and sufficient is integral to a successful pregnancy. And when we say successful pregnancy, the word successful means that we have a viable infant born of, of an acceptable birth weight, that that infant is free of congenital defects, and that we have a favorable long-term health outlook for both the mother and the infant. Let's start out our conversation about nutrition by discussing some hormones that are important to this conversation. The first one is progesterone. Remember, um, progesterone relaxes smooth muscle. Um, it sustains the pregnancy, it's secreted by the placenta, and it relaxes smooth muscle. So therefore, it relaxes the uterus, which is a good thing. It stops the uterus from contracting as it grows and enlarges to house that baby, but it also relaxes our gastrointestinal system. So now we have, um, decreased peristalsis, which causes the mom to suffer from constipation, heartburn, and delayed gastric emptying. She also, um, progesterone, uh, by relaxing that gastrointestinal tract and slowing peristalsis, also increases the absorption of iron and calcium. So this is how um, that baby is going to get those extra nutrients because as the food digests slowly through the GI tract, more nutrients are going to be absorbed. The mother's basal metabolic rate is going to increase by 15 to 20 percent in pregnancy, and this is caused by the greater oxygen needs of the fetus and the growing uh, maternal support tissues. So therefore, her basal metabolic rate is going to increase. Um, thinking back to blood volume, so remember in pregnancy, that mom got about 1,500 milliliters of extra volume into her circulatory system. About 1,000 of it is plasma, the other 500 or so of it is blood, and that causes hemodilution because there's more plasma um, entering the blood circulation or entering our circulatory system, then blood, we get hemodilution of our circulatory system. This actually lowers the hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, it also results in cardiac hypertrophy and increased ventilatory rate to accommodate that increased blood volume. We are also going to see an increase in glomerular filtration rate. That is because mom's nutrients um, and oxygen are flowing over to the baby and all of baby's um, waste from uh, their body, fetus's waste, is traveling back through the cord in the, in the, through the placenta into mom's uh, body. So mom's body is going to excrete waste for the baby. Therefore, her glomerular filtration rate is going to increase to accommodate for that extra waste that she's need, needing to eliminate from her body. Maternal weight gain. So this is an important part of this conversation. Um, there are three components that contribute to the weight that mom is going to gain in pregnancy. The first is her body composition is going to change. We already talked about that extra blood supply. She also gets extracellular fluid, extra volumes of extracellular fluid. All that contributes to weight gain. Then you have maternal support tissues like the uterus and the breasts. And then, of course, you have all the products of conception being the fetus and the placenta and the amniotic fluid. So first trimester weight gain should be about two to four pounds. Um, that's consistent across the board. Women in the first trimester should gain no more than two to four pounds. Um, and then it's approximately one pound per week in the second and third trimesters for women who have a normal BMI prior to pregnancy. And that's an important conversation, so let's talk about that. We base the total amount that women should gain in pregnancy on their pre-pregnancy BMI. So if your mom was underweight when she became pregnant, she will need to gain 28 to 40 pounds. A woman of normal BMI prior to pregnancy will need to gain 25 to 35 pounds. Women who are an overweight BMI will gain 15 to 25 pounds, and women who are of an obese BMI prior to pregnancy will gain 11 to 20 pounds. So notice that everyone is gaining weight. Um, even your mom who's obese has to gain weight because those um, breasts are going to grow, the uterus is going to grow, there is a baby, and they're all, all, 
are all of those products of conception. You will need to memorize this table. You will very likely be tested in numerous different ways on weight gain during pregnancy. When we look at how that um, weight accumulates or, or where does it go, when we look at that normal mom who's supposed to gain, normal BMI mom who's supposed to gain 25 to 35 pounds, um, we have about a pound in the placenta, about 2.2 pounds of amniotic fluid, another 2.2 pounds in the breasts, another 2.2 pounds in the uterus, average baby weight, 7.7 .7 pounds, three extra pounds of body fluids, three extra pounds of blood, and six and a half pounds of maternal stores. That is gonna give us 28 pounds total. Let's talk for just a minute about carbohydrates and fat. So the fetus prefers glucose as their primary energy source. Um, our human bodies um, all prefer glucose as the primary energy source, but it's going to be really integral to the growth and survival of this baby. Glucose is very important to the fetus. So because of that, mom's body is going to shift to using fat as a primary source of energy. So normally, if we're not pregnant, um, all human bodies prefer to use glucose as a primary energy source. In the pregnant mom, glucose is going to feed over to the baby, and mom is going to um, start to burn fat as her primary energy source. Now, if the mother does not consume sufficient energy, then her uh, sufficient carbohydrates and fats for energy, her body will then start to break down protein for energy, which we really don't want to happen. The fetus needs protein for growth, and we really don't want that mom's body to break down protein. Carbohydrates, therefore, should comprise 50% of the total caloric intake. Carbohydrates are where we get glucose from. Mom needs glucose, baby needs glucose. 50% of daily caloric intake from carbohydrates. Fats is also going to increase to around 30% of total daily caloric intake for the mom. If that mom's pre-pregnancy BMI was normal, she is going to consume an extra 340 kilocalories per day during the second trimester and an extra 452 kilocalories per day during the third trimester. Notice that there aren't extra calorie consumption in the first trimester because weight gain is very minimal in the first trimester. And I think it's really important to help women understand that pregnancy is not a time to restrict calories or to try to lose weight. Even if you were overweight when you became pregnant, we have to gain weight during pregnancy. Moving on to some specific nutrients, protein is going to increase. So we said 50%, increase to 50% of total caloric intake for carbs, increase up to 30% of total caloric intake for fat. Protein is going to increase to 71 grams per day. Um, normal is about 45, 46 grams per day. So almost double to 71 grams of protein per day. This is because we're building a baby. Um, amino acids, protein breaks down to amino acids. Amino acids are how we grow and maintain tissues. And pregnant women are trying to grow a baby. So they have extra, carb, uh, extra protein needs. All of the items on this slide have no change over pre-pregnancy requirements. Now, pregnant women still need to eat adequate healthy amounts of these nutrients, but they don't increase over what we need pre-pregnancy. So one that is really surprising to a lot of students is calcium. Calcium for an adult woman is 1,000 milligrams per day. That does not increase in pregnancy. Um, there are a lot of vitamins as well that also do not increase in need in pregnancy. Now here we're back to something that does increase, folate. Folate is what's found naturally in foods. Folic acid is the supplement that women are going to take. Now, if you think back to discussions about contraception and fetal development, the neural tube, which is the spinal column, the neural tube closes around three to four weeks after conception. So most women don't even know they're pregnant by the time that neural tube is closing. So folate or folic acid is important for 
pre-pregnancy. So we want women to be uh, consuming adequate amounts of folate or folic acid before they become pregnant. So that when that neural tube is developing and forming in those first several weeks after conception, we don't have what is called a neural tube defect develop. We want that neural tube to close completely from head all the way to tail. Um, Pre-pregnant women should be consuming um, 0.4 milligrams per day of folic acid, um, which equates to 400 micrograms. And once that mom becomes pregnant, that's going to increase to 0.6 milligrams per day or 600 micrograms. Now that folic acid is going to be found in the prenatal vitamin. Um, so they don't need to take it as a separate supplement. If pregnant women are taking a prenatal vitamin, folic acid is going to be in that prenatal vitamin. Foods that contain folic acid, green leafy vegetables, legumes, seeds, and orange juice are all good sources of folic acid. I think it's important to remember that if a mom is taking an anticonvulsant medication, or if we have a multi-fetal pregnancy, so twins, triplets, and so on, then we are going to need larger than these usual doses of folic acid to support this pregnancy. Um, iron does increase in pregnancy. Um, Intake should be 27 to 30 milligrams per day. Your average um, non-pregnant woman needs about 18 milligrams per day. So an increase of almost double of iron. Supplementation will be with 30 milligrams of ferrous iron beginning daily in the second trimester and is often necessary to prevent iron deficiency anemia. Again, that extra supplemental iron is found in the prenatal vitamin. Foods that contain iron that we can recommend that moms eat, meats, eggs, anything that comes from an animal is going to be high in iron, but also your green leafy vegetables, dried fruits, and legumes are plant-based sources of iron. It's important to note that when iron and folic acid supplements are taken together, the absorption of zinc is going to be inhibited. Therefore, zinc supplements are often needed. So therefore, if you look at your prenatal vitamins, they are going to often have a zinc supplement in them as well. And that's because a zinc deficiency can result in a central nervous system malformations in the infant. Let's talk for just a minute about iron deficiency anemia. So we already said that in pregnancy, we get hemodilution, so your H and H is going to normally drop. That's called um, physiologic anemia of pregnancy. What we want is for that H and H or that hemoglobin to stay higher than 11 grams um, per deciliter and our hematocrit to stay higher than 33 in the first and third trimesters. And our hemoglobin, we want to be higher than 10 and a half in the, um, in the um, first and uh, second, or in the first trimester, and our hematocrit to be higher than 32 in the first or in the second trimester. If it falls below these numbers, so 11 or 10 and a half, and then 33, 32, depending on the trimester, we are going to consider that iron deficiency anemia that will need further supplementation of iron. Remember that whenever your body is um, deficient in iron, the heart will compensate by increasing cardiac output. This therefore increases the workload of the heart. So we, um, we don't want to have um, a significantly low hemoglobin and hematocrit um, because that is going to increase the workload of the heart. Iron deficiency anemia is also associated with something called pica. Pica is the craving of non-nutritious and often non-food substances. So for example, cornstarch, um, dirt, ice chips, um, this, these intense cravings that tend to replace eating food. Um, and of course they aren't of nutritional value. We want our blood ferritin level to be greater than 12 micrograms per liter. And um, I've already mentioned that prenatal vitamins often contain 30 milligrams of iron. If we do have iron deficiency anemia, we will need um, a, the dose to increase to 60 to 120 milligrams per day of ferrous sulfate. 
very, very, very important that you can counsel women about taking an iron supplement. Um, and I've listed for you some of the more common teaching points. So iron is best absorbed on an empty stomach. So we recommend it be taken in between meals. If it does make women nauseous, we can recommend that they take it at bedtime. Vitamin C is going to enhance the absorption of iron. So when pregnant women take their prenatal vitamin, we recommend that they take it with um, orange juice and not with milk or caffeine. Milk and caffeine will interfere with the absorption of iron. Women often need a stool softener when they're on an iron supplement, or they can just increase roughage and fluid in their diet to prevent further constipation. The best option for women in pregnancy is to consume a healthy, balanced diet. Um, supplementation is not the preferred method for us to get our nutrients as human beings. Now we know that we do need some supplementation in pregnancy, but we want over an overarching healthy, well-balanced diet for pregnant women. Fluid intake is going to increase to two to three liters or closer to three liters of water per day. That equates to 64 to 80 ounces per day. We do want to encourage pregnant women to limit caffeine intake to less than 200 milligrams per day. Excessive calcium intake does contribute to miscarriage and it also contributes to intrauterine growth restriction. The preferred intake is going to be from water, milk, or fruit juice. There are a population uh, or several populations that are at risk for malnutrition and pregnancy. So obviously adolescents are at the top of this risk category, but also women who suffer from significant nausea and vomiting, who already had anemia before they conceived. So preconception anemia, they're gonna carry that with them into the pregnancy. Then hemodilution is going to further drop their H&H. &H. Women who come into the pregnancy with eating disorders such as anorexia or bulimia, uh, pica can contribute um, significantly to malnutrition. Uh, women who have socioeconomic problems and are unable to purchase healthy foods, and then constipation, especially significant constipation can contribute to malnourishment. Let's talk for just a second about phenylketonuria. So phenylketonuria is a genetic disorder. So, um, you know, your, your mom has been born with this disorder. It's autosomal recessive in which the body is unable to process phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is an amino acid found in protein. And so when women eat protein that contain phenylalanine, their body is unable to process it. The levels of phenylalanine in their blood get higher and higher and higher and can become toxic. So women who um, are diagnosed with maternal or phenylketonuria um, really need to monitor their blood levels throughout pregnancy because remember, we need extra protein to grow this baby. We already talked about that, but this mom is gonna have a problem consuming that extra protein. So we're going to monitor her phenyl, uh, phenylalanine levels throughout pregnancy. We want her to be between two and eight milligrams per deciliter. We're going to encourage her to eat foods that are low in phenylalanine starting at three months before pregnancy and then throughout the pregnancy. We want her to avoid fish, poultry, meat, eggs, nuts, and dairy as those are all very high in phenylalanine. And we also are going to ask her to avoid aspartame. Aspartame is an artificial sweetener found in a lot of diet drinks, diet sodas, and sugar-free foods. Um, aspartame contains phenylalanine, so we must avoid that completely. Another topic that is worth discussing as part of maternal nutrition is women who adhere to a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Women, uh, regardless of whether they're pregnant or not, um, who are vegetarian or vegan tend to suffer from low intake of protein, low vitamin B12, low iron, low zinc, and low calcium. All of those are nutrients that are primarily, if not completely found in animal products. B12 is only found in animal meats and animal products. So therefore, if you eat a truly vegan diet, women uh, will be deficient in B12. So um, a, a well-planned, well-balanced diet with lots of variety is the key. And then we may need to supplement, um, we need, may need extra supplementation of some of these nutrients for a mom who is a strict vegetarian or vegan. 
fish, fish is always a topic we have to talk about in pregnancy. The FDA does warn against consuming fish and shellfish during pregnancy because of the high mercury levels that are found in certain um, fish and shellfish. Mercury is toxic to the fetal brain, so fetal brain development can be impaired if the mom consumes high levels of mercury. However, fish is also high in omega-3, so we know that in your non-pregnant adults, that contributes to heart health, um, but in your pregnant mom, uh, omega-3 is needed for fetal brain and eye development. So there are, we don't tell women to not eat fish completely, but we do have some recommendations. So albacore tuna should be limited to six ounces per week. We want to avoid tilefish, shark, swordfish, marlin, orange ruffy, and king mackerel. All of those have significantly high mercury levels. Total seafood consumption should be limited to 12 ounces per week. So notice we're not saying no fish. Some fish is beneficial. We just want to limit it to 12 ounces per week and we want it to be what we consider a safe fish. Moving on to foodborne illness, Salmonella, E. coli, and Listeria all are, are bacteria that cause foodborne illness. Um, the mom might just feel, you know, a little bit sick or, or maybe even significantly sick, but will recover. Unfortunately, though, these can severely damage um, your growing fetus. So Salmonella can actually be fatal to your fetus. Um, e. coli can cause um, hemolytic uremic syndrome, um, severe anemia and kidney failure in your mom, which will contribute um, to problems for your fetus. And listeria can cause stillbirth and miscarriage. Norovirus is another um, foodborne illness. This one is from a virus, so the norovirus. Um, this one is very contagious and um, can contribute to dehydration in your mom, which is also going to severely or seriously, could seriously affect your fetus. Absolutely no alcohol or drug use in pregnancy. Nothing is considered safe. Um, not even the smallest bit of alcohol um, is considered safe in pregnancy. The reason is because all um, human beings have a different or all pregnant women have a different threshold um, for alcohol consumption. So in some women, you know, one drink a day may be totally benign and cause no problems for the fetus. And the next woman, one drink a day could lead to fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and that does vary for all women. So therefore we say no alcohol, no drug use in pregnancy. We also want to try to avoid those foodborne illnesses that we just talked about. So let's talk through some high risk foods. Lunch meat, so pre-packaged lunch meat, any of your soft cheeses, unpasteurized milk and juices. Those are um, milks and juices that have not gone through a sterilization process prior to being bottled. And then finally, lactation. So after this baby um, is born and mom wants to breastfeed, we do have some nutrient requirements in lactation. Kilocalorie increase is going to be just as high in lactation, 330 to 400 extra calories per day because it takes energy to make milk production. Remember, energy is calories, so we need those extra calories to produce milk. Total calorie intake has to be higher than 1,800 in order to maintain a milk supply. So if your mom is seriously dieting and her calorie consumption falls to below 1,800, milk supply is going to be affected. Protein requirements are still elevated at 71 grams per day. Now we want to increase uh, vitamin A and vitamin C so that there is more of those two vitamins available in the breast milk for the baby. We still need adequate fluid intake, two to three liters. Folic acid should still be um, elevated at around 500 micrograms per day. And again, caffeine limited to less than 200 milligrams per day and no alcohol, no drugs. Okay, hopefully you found that discussion on maternal nutrition helpful. Of course, if you have any questions or concerns, you can leave them in a comment below or you can reach out to me via email or on social media. Have a wonderful day.